So good morning, everyone. I am Kali Irwana. I'm the Deputy Director General on DigiConnect. And um, I uh, I'm planning to give you an overview of our policies today uh, in the session that is uh, uh, devoted to international cooperation and cybersecurity. And I uh, have the, the pleasure to have with me two experts in cybersecurity. Uh, uh, starting with Bart Brunel, uh, uh, who is full professor at uh, 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 KU Lo Leuven, uh, and uh, he will give us his view on cybersecurity and the challenges ahead. And I have also the big pleasure to have Oleg Brot, who is the R&D Director for Deutsche Telekom Innovation Labs in Israel and the Chief Innovation Officer for Cyber at Ben Gurion University. And uh, Oleg is also a big expert in this field. He will tell us how he sees things, what are the R&D challenges, mainly in cybersecurity for the future, and how to see the technology developing. So uh, you have a collection of presentation, one which is more on the policy side, uh, and uh, uh, two that are more on the technology challenges and policy challenges, and um, the R&D uh, perspectives. So that's for uh, this morning session, and it will be around the international dimension of all these aspects. I'll start so with a, a quick overview of our EU cybersecurity activities from the EU side. Those of you uh, who are familiar with this would, would be just a quick reminder. And I will zoom right after on how we see uh, our policies in the international context, the type of dialogues that we have with uh, partners uh, around the world, uh, and the type of cooperation that we are working on. So that will be my, my presentation. Our cybersecurity strategy was revised. Our first, first EU cybersecurity strategy was elaborated in 2012, and in 2017 we revised it. And we issued a communication that, is, uh, that, that uh, presents a strategy to the member states along three main axes. Uh, an axe on uh, resilience, how to make sure that uh, our businesses, our citizens, uh, uh, are shielded against cyber attacks, so mainly resilience. Uh, second uh, a pillar around deterrence, so what happens in case we are attacked. Uh, uh, the, and uh, the third is about exactly the international dimension of cybersecurity. Uh, with roles uh, of the different DGs uh, around three uh, pillars also uh, well identified. For our DG, DG Connect, uh, the first pillar is the center of gravity of our activities. That we have the role also of coordinating the three pillars, and we established a task force with all DGs concerned uh, in the Commission that follows the implementation of that strategy point by point. The strategy included a big, uh, so it's not only a big orientation, but had uh, uh, an action plan with different actions uh, addressing the different pillars, and we follow the monitoring, and we follow and monitor the execution of these actions. Several of the actions are actions to be done by the member states, because cybersecurity and security are mainly in the responsibility of the member states. But I'll show you that with time we have developed frameworks that enable us to identify what could be done at your level, what is the added value of working in a multinational context at the EU level, and uh, uh, how these uh, frameworks that we establish are helping us today uh, coordinate better and shield better uh, and uh, ensure higher cybersecurity for businesses and citizens. A lot of the actions are still in the member states, but created framework for coordination, and we identified the role of the different actors, as you'll see uh, afterwards. And I'll say that for the second and third pillar, member states are extremely important. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, we're, we're more and more, we're, we also see for these pillars, like we've done for pillar one, more cooperation frameworks developing 
uh, and uh, ensuring a higher also uh, impact of the action that we do, be it on deterrence or be it on role on the international scene. I'll focus my presentation on the first pillar, but also give you uh, snapshots of what is done on the second and third pillar when needed. Uh, and the, so uh, the first pillar is about resilience. And uh, for, for, for that pillar, we have uh, developed means at EU level to act together with the member states. And with time, we have developed two regulatory instruments that enable us to act at EU level. One, what we call NEMFO, Network and Information Security Directive, which entered into force in August 2016. To put you in context, that, pro that directive was conceived in 2012, proposed in 2013, and took us three years to get agreement between Council and Parliament around it, given the sensitivity of the issue. But with the growing threats on cybersecurity, with the intensity of cybersecurity, uh, member states and parliament ultimately agreed on, a, on, a, on, a, uh, on this directive. And it's extremely important because that directive has identified the roles and responsibilities uh, of the member states, the roles and responsibilities of certain of the private sector that are the operators of critical infrastructures and critical services, or we call essential services, and has also set the cooperation framework uh, to ensure that we, when needed, we can act collectively and ensure a higher level of cybersecurity. That was 2016. And we developed, since 2016, a new uh, regulatory framework, which is the Cybersecurity Act, that uh, will enter into force in the coming days, uh, that uh, added to the cooperation framework uh, uh, certification scheme, cybersecurity certification scheme, very important, uh, that uh, we, I'll come back to later, but uh, it complemented uh, the, the uh, regulatory framework that we had under the NIST directive, with also a collective effort could be done at your level to certify product and services in terms of cybersecurity. And we, the, we took also the opportunity of Cybersecurity Act to reinforce the role of the European Agency on Cybersecurity, ENISA. I'll also explain you know, what, what is ENISA is very quickly and its role. These were the two regulatory instruments that we, we use today, and I'll go back uh, into details to show you how, uh, what is the added value on how we operate within these. And we've been investing also in research innovation, so uh, on cybersecurity, mainly in age 2020, and for the period 2016-2020, we have put around 90 million euro per year, between 90 and 100 million euro per year, on cybersecurity activities in uh, uh, the framework program age 2020. And we do it in partnership with industry. We have a public-private partnership with the Industry Association, EXO, uh, that help us identify the priorities and get higher leverage and higher commitment from industry in investment and research innovation in this field. But we don't invest only in research innovation. We invest also in the uptake of the technology, and main, mainly in areas of public interest. And we do that today under the Connecting Europe facility, which is a program for deployment of capacities and infrastructure. And there we have uh, smaller size actions, but, uh, but they uh, or smaller investment, but we're with high impact because it's about uh, ensuring a wider rollout of cybersecurity technology and solutions in uh, areas of public interest to a large extent. This is for the current financial framework between 2014 and 20, and I focus on 16, 20 when it comes to research innovation. But beyond 2020, uh, we have proposed an ambitious program on cybersecurity. We think it's time. Our level of investment in cybersecurity in Europe if you compare it with similar economies like the US, are 15% or 20% the level. It's one-fifth of the total investment that are done in, in the US. So it was time to beef up our investment, including at your level, and seek for higher leverage of the investment from the member states and from industry. Uh, and we, we, we did increase you know, the 90 million. There were half of that between 2004 
2010 and 2014. We're increasing gradually, but we will make a big step forward from 2020. This is the proposal the Commission has put on the table, on the table for the next financial framework. It will be around 3 billion euros over seven years, so you see it will be more than 400, 450 million euro per year. Uh, the, uh, uh, the big investment will be done in capacities building. It will be under the Digital Euro program. This is a new program where we have planned 2 billion euros to be invested in uh, capacity building uh, in cybersecurity. I mean, capacity building means investments in uh, cyber ranges, investments in high forms computing, artificial intelligence tools for cybersecurity to be able to track cyber attacks, investments in capacities for post quantum cryptography, so to be able to, sh to make sure that uh, we adapt to the latest technologies that will come into the cybersecurity uh, sphere, like quantum technologies. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, the, these are the type of capacities that we'll be supporting under the Digital Europe program. And in addition to that, we will continue supporting research innovation. There will be a complementarity between support on research, development, innovation, and investing in the rollout. So that this complementarity is extremely important uh, between so research and deployment. And in order to manage these programs and to ensure that we also co-invest together with the member states and have a higher leverage uh, uh, from the EU investment, uh, we propose to the member state to set up a body, uh, uh, an organization that can manage these programs and will be co-governed together with the member state. This is the Cybersecurity Competence Center. Uh, this is still under negotiation with member states and the Parliament to uh, uh, finalize the proposal and come up with a, an organization, a body that can help us co-invest together with member states and with industry in uh, uh, building up our cybersecurity capacities and in research innovation in this field. So that's the investment in research innovation. But when you do policy, you do regulation, you do investment, and you do also mobilization, sharing of uh, knowledge, etc. These are the three instruments that you have when you do policy. And on, when it comes to uh, information sharing, promo proposing cooperation, uh, promoting cooperation, uh, support to skills, awareness raising, we have set up an agency, that uh, the ENISA agency, 10 years already. And uh, we reinforced it under the Cybersecurity Act. We gave it a role also in the certification. Uh, uh, and we, we reinforced, we proposed to reinforce its resources to be able to cope with the new challenges re related to cybersecurity. And ESA helps us, the agency helps us in implementing the, NIS direct, the NIS directive, uh, uh, in particular the cooperation framework to that. Uh, 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 th that is devoted to that. And also, uh, ENISA helps us with information sharing, uh, awareness raising, etc. These are the, our means to implement the resilience part. And you'll see that for each of the means, we have dedicated goals. Uh, the NIS Directive, its main features uh, is first that uh, it uh, uh, put obligations on the member states to reinforce their own operational capacities, to set up uh, in each member state at least uh, what we call uh, uh, a computer security uh, uh, information response team, uh, that uh, these are CSERTs that uh, uh, will uh, uh, reinforce the member states' capacity to identify threats, to respond to threats, to cyber threats. Uh, and uh, some member states had these before, but with the NIS directive, all member states now will have to have a team that uh, can respond uh, to incidents related to cybersecurity. So these are the CSATs, and what also the directive imposes on member states to have an authority that follows cybersecurity. Uh, the, and in addition to that, uh, the uh, directive uh, puts in place two cooperation frameworks. 
a cooperation framework uh, that is, uh, uh, ensures coordin uh, coordination of policy issues related to cybersecurity and uh, uh, cooperation also at operational level between the CSERTs networks. Uh, and that uh, identifies the role of the member states, identifies the role of the Commission facilitating this cooperation, but also uh, it has obligations on the private sector and in particular uh, on operators of essential services that, uh, that on which depends our economy, on which depends a large part of our public uh, administration and public sector services. And these uh, uh, operators need to be identified. Once identified, they would have obligations in terms of reporting on the way they shield themselves, they shield their infrastructure, they shield their services, and they need to report also on incidents that they, uh, uh, and the way they respond to these incidents. That's the NIS directive, fixes obligations, fixes also the role, fixes the cooperation framework. An example of what we do with the cooperation framework, uh, we develop together with the member states a blueprint for coordinated response to large-scale incident and crisis. And that blueprint was proposed and we're testing this blueprint together with the member states when we have large-scale incidents and crisis. That's the type of cooperation that we have built up under the NIS directive and through the interaction and dialogue that we had with the member states and the different actors. The cybersecurity certification scheme under the Cybersecurity Act, it's a voluntary European cybersecurity certification framework uh, that uh, enables us to create fit for purpose EU cybersecurity certification schemes for ICT products and services. And the, uh, 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 the main goal of the certification scheme is to make sure that uh, products that are certified following the scheme are, uh, have certification that are valid across the EU, which would simplify the lives of uh, the businesses, uh, but also ensures a similar level of protection uh, uh, against cyber threats across the EU. That's what the uh, scheme has uh, as goals. It is just, uh, it will be uh, uh, the, the entering into force of the Cybersecurity Act, as I said, in, in June, and that will enable us to start working together with member states and the stakeholders on the first certifications uh, uh, of product and services uh, that will come. It will rely, as we know, certification relies a lot on standards, standardization, and we, we start with what exists as standardization uh, uh, schemes uh, worldwide, but uh, it would also require that we have, uh, in addition to the certification scheme, uh, an active uh, dialogue with the standardization bodies in the EU to make sure that we have also, uh, we adapt our, standardization, our standards to the development of technology to be able to face the challenge of cybersecurity. So the, uh, that was the NIS Directive, the Cybersecurity Act, and its uh, cybersecurity certification scheme. I mentioned that we're also proposing a body to manage EU support together with the member states and uh, uh, EU support for research and innovation for rollout of technology. That's the Cybersecurity Center. Uh, the, uh, the center will, be, will have a, as role, as I said, the uh, uh, ensuring co-investment also from the member states in both activities, research innovation, and mainly in the rollout of technology, and building capacities, and in bringing these capacities to businesses and to public administrations across the EU. And it will rely on a network of coordination centers or, or, uh, that, that will be operating uh, at member state level. So the center and the network will be uh, uh, ensuring the implementation of the programs uh, and, the, and it will be governed together by the member states and the commission. Uh, this is still in negotiation, so you have here the Commission proposal, and we hope to be able to get the agreement of Council and Parliament on the Centre 
as soon as possible so that we start building it and to be ready for the implementation of the programs on the next financial framework. In order to prepare for the center and to ensure either further cooperation between the research uh, centers across the EU, we already launched pilot projects for uh, the networking of European excellence and competence centers in cybersecurity. We have put uh, 63.5 million euros into four projects that bring together the best research teams across the EU and uh, uh, into, uh, to bring them together to develop common agendas and implement these agendas for research innovation and to validate research uh, innovation agendas with industrial use cases. So this is cooperation between the research community but also cooperation with industry. Uh, we have uh, 160 partners participating in these projects, four projects, and through this cooperation we, and through these pilots, we, we, uh, we reinforce the coordination, we reinforce the work together, working together across the EU on cybersecurity and prepare for the implementation of the programs and the setup of the center and its network of competence centers uh, in the future. On international cooperation, we work on three levels. So from the wider perspective, where cybersecurity is part of uh, wider third country relations uh, in the EU association agreements, all types, I mean, and most of the EU association agreements, cyber is present as an area for cooperation but also uh, uh, under the G20, G7 framework, cybersecurity today is uh, a, a subject, a recurring subject discussed in these fora. Uh, and uh, from the Commission side, we ensure that what we, get, what we have uh, agreed together with the Member States is presented in these G20 and G7 uh, as part of the cooperation frameworks that we could have with uh, trading partners around the world. We have also cybersecurity today as a recurring topic, a permanent topic in our dialogues that we do with our partners around the world on information society. So these are dialogues that, is, that are dedicated to digital policies. We have these with Canada, US, Mexico, Brazil, India, Ch China, Japan, Taiwan. We, and these dialogues uh, enable us to go a bit further than just general, general uh, commitments that we can have in the higher level uh, uh, agreements. We have us to go further, uh, engage together in common actions, common reflections, but also uh, when needed, we can have common investment in research, innovation, etc. We put a lot of emphasis on explaining our uh, policy and to ensure uh, also alignment of these policies with our major trading partners, like we did for uh, the certification. I'll come back to that because we are, we are the first ones almost worldwide to propose a, a certification scheme related to uh, cybersecurity. And in addition to that, we have dialogues that are dedicated to cybersecurity that are handled together with our colleagues in EEAS. Uh, that are with US, with Brazil, with China, with Japan. So you could see we have uh, uh, different layers in the general policy agreements, general trade as, uh, association uh, agreements, but also uh, in the uh, digital policies dialogue, and we have dialogues that are dedicated to cybersecurity in particular. The, our general approach is that make sure that what we have as negotiated provisions or agreements on trade, I want to go to a higher level, are compatible with EU acquis and practices, as I mentioned. We try to identify and promote common EU and partner country regulatory acquis. We look at practices, how these are done. We look at approaches and principles in the area of cybersecurity and digital trade. And we address and resolve concrete market access issues. We look particularly if cybersecurity is used to block market access, 
uh, and we look also at uh, uh, the, the, uh, the impact of uh, schemes related to cybersecurity or to policies related to cybersecurity on market access. Uh, the, um, uh, what we try to do also when it, when it comes to the bilateral or multilateral dialogues that are related to either digital policies or cybersecurity, as I said, is to go a bit deeper into the discussions. Uh, and uh, you would imagine that depending on the trading partners, when we have like-minded trading partners, we go further in terms of exchanges of best practices, in terms of alignment of, of policies, and looking at uh, the, the details of the implementation of our policies. For example, you'll see this, trading partners like Japan, where we have uh, very similar approach to cybersecurity or to privacy or to data protection in general, where you see that we, we go a bit deeper than with other trading partners uh, uh, around the world in exchanging information and trying to align our policies to make sure that we facilitate trade between, the, not, uh, not only to facilitate trade between Japan and the EU, but also to address cybersecurity challenges together uh, uh, and collaborate in this area. For other trading partners, we're more on the uh, uh, ensuring market access uh, and uh, also on warning on policies that are undertaken by these trading partners, like we did recently with China, warning that such policies, uh, policies that uh, might have impact on security of our infrastructure or security uh, 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 of uh, all types of digital services, uh, that these policies uh, uh, pose problems for us. So uh, these are the type of, uh, uh, I would say, objectives that we try to get from these uh, international cooperation. I take here the cooperation with Japan. Uh, I think it's the most advanced uh, as far as uh, deepening the uh, reflection and getting with collective actions. <clears throat> and uh, with Japan, we have, uh, uh, we're co-finding a, a cooperation, a coordination support action from H2020, uh, from, from the EU side, that looks at human and technical issues regarding cybersecurity. It goes a bit beyond research and development although it is around research and development, but addresses all the aspects related to the uptake of technology, to the way uh, cybersecurity solutions could be spread across the economy and how the policies related to cybersecurity uh, impact that, that diffusion of technology. So we'll look at data sharing, privacy and the legal framework, and uh, the training issues, awareness raising, and we also try to identify institutional cooperation uh, together with, with Japan and look at innovation, so uh, the, the both in terms of use of cybersecurity tools, but also innovation in the development of cybersecurity solutions. And of course, we look at research and development cooperation. That's the example with Japan. And uh, we also engaging with other you know, like-minded, hopefully they will remain like-minded economy like the US. Included, uh, we have uh, cybersecurity is, is on the agenda of the cooperation with the US since, uh, since we know about cybersecurity issues. But it has, uh, you know, it's, it's been uh, intensifying uh, recently. We have uh, uh, also, uh, under the information society dialogue recently, took cybersecurity as one of the priority topics. Uh, we did, uh, we exchanged information on recent development in our policies. And we looked also at the issue of uh, certification. The colleagues in the US have a different approach to certification in all areas, uh, a, a different approach, but with the same goal. But we tried to see how these different approaches, uh, one that is more re related to certification frameworks and regulatory uh, measures to uh, ensure the application of the certification frameworks, and uh, this is what we do in the EU in general, and it, for cybersecurity as well. But US does more, uh, you look, uh, has more policies ma mainly related to exposed uh, acts, and the action not exposed, but they have guidance, they have standards. We're working also on standards. 
So we're trying to see whether at least we could use the same standards when it comes to certification. We apply them with our rule, uh, with our uh, procedures, and they apply them through their uh, guidance, uh, uh, procedures, etc. So the, uh, that's uh, what we try to uh, uh, get to in, in the dialogue. Uh, this is an example, and I mentioned the certification scheme, in addition to exchange of information and try to tackle cybersecurity issues in a common approach. This is more details the uh, what we had in the cybersecurity dialogue, not the information society, but the cybersecurity dialogue. We have joint commitment to a global, open, stable, and secure cyber secure, uh, cyberspace. We worked on updates on respective cyber strategies, so we exchanged information between us, and we looked at uh, how we look at not only cyber resilience, which is what we do, uh, you know, which is a, the, a very important part, part of our policies, as I mentioned, for DigiConnect in particular, but also we look at cyber crime, how can we cooperate in, in this area. But under the co coordination and cooperation uh, for cybersecurity, in the cybersecurity dialogue, we look also the internet governance, so cybersecurity and internet governance, and the international cyber stability and security issues. Uh, the, uh, where, uh, the, this is the, the part that uh, is handled by our colleagues in EAS, but uh, they are chef to field for that and we support them. And uh, we, we look at the, uh, uh, the application of uh, the conventions that are done, in particular the Budapest Convention, regarding cyber uh, security and the respect uh, of cybersecurity by uh, the, uh, 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 the countries that signed this convention. Uh, uh, and the, a big part of the activity is uh, on making the uh, different uh, me uh, or the, the different uh, uh, countries, uh, also the other states that, that uh, uh, we have dialogues with, uh, we work together with our colleagues in the US on making these states accountable when we have cyber attacks originated from these uh, member states. And on this point, on this part, I think on the EU side, we have progressed as well in May. Uh, so last month, there were uh, important steps forward done in terms of attribution of cyber attacks uh, and in terms also of collective response to cyber attacks. Example of, uh, of uh, also deepening the coordination with the US, this is the uh, Aegis uh, EU-US uh, coordination support action. Like we did with Japan, we're financing a group of stakeholders to discuss and to um, elaborate uh, or to deepen the cooperation in different areas. This is one of these. And it includes partners on the EU side and partners on the US side and also the European American a Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, that is between the two. So that's the type of actions that we do on the international scene. So what I've done is given you a snapshot on our policies the uh, means that we have for these policies, the regulatory means, the investment means, the information sharing means, the awareness raising means, uh, give you an idea of what we can do with these means uh, very quickly and how we're progressing on this side and also uh, give you a snapshot of and the international cooperation frameworks that we have established and the dialogues and where we try to get from these dialogues. That was uh, uh, the introduction to this, uh, or I mean, my, my uh, introductory speech. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, uh, I'm Despina. Yes, I give it to you. Thank you, Khalil. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Despina Spanu. I apologize for the late arrival, but you were in the safest hands you could have been on cybersecurity with Mr. Ruana. So, my name is Despina Spanu. I'm Director for Cybersecurity. I welcome you to today's uh, event uh, from my side. Khalil gave you an overview of uh, our European but also international work. Indeed, uh, just to mention, I, I was myself in um, the uh, regulatory dialogue we had with the United States and Canada a few weeks ago. 
And it is very impressive to see the convergence of uh, the topics when it comes to the priorities between uh, these jurisdictions and, and the interest we have in each other's work. When it came to Europe, there was a lot of interest on how we have managed to have a common approach between 28 member states. It is indeed one of the most important developments in cybersecurity in the last uh, two, three years, uh, not only thanks to the regulatory proposals we have done, but also in terms of policy determination, the diplomatic toolbox, et cetera. There is really a united front. And there was a lot of interest in this approach, but also on the work that we do in Europe, both in the United States, but also in Canada, especially on certain topics that are particularly high on the agenda, like the security of 5G networks, uh, where there is work on all sides of the Atlantic going on. So, um, in this context, we have with us uh, some renowned international specialists uh, to complete the sessions of the university for today. And we will try to save some time. I will ask for some time uh, um, from all of you, from all, both speakers, so that we can offer you the floor also for questions and comments, because also the university is about discussing uh, the topics we have uh, on the table. So talking about um, the international perspective, one of the most important topics that uh, we are discussing in addition to security is also data privacy. And uh, in this respect, cryptology becomes particularly pertinent. And I am very, very pleased that, that we have with us one of the most renowned international uh, cryptographic uh, experts, uh, a professor from the University of Leven, who is also the head of the Department of Electrical Engineering, but uh, also many other things. He has uh, been as research fellow in various universities, including in the United States, if I'm not mistaken, at the University of Berkeley, but also in various European countries. Uh, hundreds of scientific publications, uh, inventor of five patents. Uh, Professor Bart Prenel is known to every expert uh, when it comes uh, to cryptology work. He's also a member of the board of the International Association for Cryptologic Research. And uh, he frequently also uh, consults with uh, governments on issues related to cryptology. I'm sure I have missed some things about you, Professor Bernal. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us. Thank you for taking the time. And we understand that you will give us a perspective of the trends in security and uh, data privacy, actually, in the world today. Morning, and while my presentation is being set up, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. I've been involved um, since more than 30 years in EU projects. In fact, I was involved in the first EU crypto project between 1988 and 1992. And I, I was told in 92 that you, EU would never fund again research on cryptography. There was kind of a crypto winter in Europe between 92 and 99. It was even um, not allowed to do research on cryptography with European funds. But fortunately, this trend has uh, been reversed. So I have some trends and the challenges related to this. I'm trying to predict what's going to happen. Prediction is very difficult, especially of the future, as you know. So I may make mistakes. So we're going to see the IoT. This is clear. There is debates on how big it will be. But the latest numbers say between 20 and 30 billion devices by 2020. Of course, the IoT makes IT also more intrusive and less avoidable and stealthy. Um, for example, many of our cities are evolving towards smart cities. Who wants to be a dumb city after all? You want smart cities. But that means as soon as you enter the city, you will actually be followed and tracked, and data about you will be collected. Now, if you go back to our legal framework, we have the GDPR, which says you have to give consent, or there has to be a need to process your data um, to actually have the right to do it. So what does it mean if, say, Antwerp becomes a smart city? Do I know when I enter Antwerp, by entering, I give consent to actually process my data? Or does Antwerp want to argue that to enter a city, they need to have my data? I think it's, going to be, it's very interesting how the IoT already um, is, in, in my view at least, is in, in conflict with the, the basic concept of GDPR. There is also many security risks. I will not speak about the details. I will more speak about the problems, which are actually not technical, although there are technical problems. But the main problems of insecurity are economic and market. And in that sense, the Cybersecurity Act tries to address some of those. I think a very big problem is liability. Who is liable for what goes wrong, especially if you build more complex systems? There is the well-known phenomenon of market of lemons. A lemon is not a fruit, but for 
For the rest people, Lemon is a used car, which is very shiny, which only costs a couple of thousand dollars. And if you drive off the parking lot, it actually falls into pieces. That's a Lemon. And so for this reason, if you buy a used car in the US, you will not give much money because as a consumer, you can't tell whether it's a good car or a mismanaged car that has been actually made very shiny uh, to look. So as a consequence, you pay lower prices. And the same phenomenon we have in IT security, the consumer can't tell between a secure product and an insecure product, so they will not be willing to pay for security, and as a consequence, the vendors will also not be willing to pay for security. So these are numbers which actually scare me. They're from Gartner, so they're reliable source, 2016. Gartner, the good news first, Gartner predicts $3 trillion market by 2020 in IoT devices. So it's a very promising market with very big growth. Um, at the same time, Gartner predicts an investment in IoT security of half a billion dollars. So my slide is misleading. The scales are different. On the left, it's for security, it's in billions. On the right, it's for devices, it's in trillions. So to explain what that means, it means if you buy a $30 webcam to put in your home, the budget for security is a fifth of a cent. Okay? Then maybe there is even worse news because Gartner a year later said that half of this fifth of a cent will go to fixing the flaws in the things you installed already. Um, and then last year they actually admitted they were wrong and they predict that it will be three billion, so one and a half billion down to that 18, three billion dollar in 2020. So now you will have uh, something like a cent to secure your webcam. So I, I still think if these numbers are correct, we have a big problem because you can't secure a webcam for one cent. So as mentioned by the previous speaker, um, there is actually legal initiatives, regulatory initiatives. In California, there is a bill that has very minimal requirements um, for January 2020. UK has more code of practice and EU has a cybersecurity act. I think the problem I see is with the fact that it's voluntary. If it's voluntary, do you really think people will increase this one cent to 10 cents or the one dollar that is needed if it's just voluntary only? I think the uh, future will tell. But my prediction is that in 2039, we will book, look back today as we look back today at the 1961 Chevrolet Corvair. It's a beautiful car, but if you look inside it, you don't want to drive it because it has no seat belts, it has no airbags, and if you get in an accident, you will be a pin will come to the steering wheel and you will stay in your seat forever. And I think in 20 years, we'll look back at our current systems and think, how could we build such systems? So trend two is about big data and data analytics for security. If you go to a large security event for the last couple of years, more or less, the message is we have to collect big data and we start from the cloud. Um, my favorite definition of the cloud is the one by Richard Stallman. The cloud is someone else's computer. And this is something that always kept amazing me as an academic. Of course, I do understand the business case, but why do we store our data on someone else's computer? Which, of course, has major consequences for our autonomy. So big data is being collected. The IoT will produce this. The cloud will produce this. Um, and of course, we as consumers, we don't pay for services, uh, but we are the product being sold. This is very well known. Um, and the challenge there, I think, is this is a snapshot of the industry. Um, of a couple of years ago. So, of course, in, if you look at GDPR, you should go to all these companies and ask which data they have about you and ask, give them consent and so on, but you don't even know they exist. They keep changing all the time. So in some sense, I think this is where the legal approach uh, reaches its limit. If you have such a complex ecosystem, then maybe having consent or having a need to process uh, may make it very hard. So at the large trade defense in security, it's clear that big data for security and AI for security is now being sold, and you also heard it was in the European agenda because the argument is very simple. If you don't know about your systems, if you don't know all the devices in your network, how can you secure them? Right? That's a simple argument. And then I think the other thing is prevention is hopeless because, well, you only have one cent, so how can you make a system secure for one cent? So rather than making things secure, we're going to actually monitor the bad guys, monitor everything, and then stop the bad guys when they do bad things. This is more or less what the belief is. Um, and then, of course, we, it's too much work because there is too much data, so we're going to apply AI. And this is the future of, in, of security industry for now. So go away from investment in prevention, go for AI and detection. Um, I see, as an academic, I see a major privacy concern there because we're being watched all the time. And I'm not sure it's actually compatible with European um, human rights. There is 
a small light at the horizon, which is at computing. Um, for many applications like autonomous vehicles, uh, you cannot send the data to the cloud, have a decision made and send it back because of latency. Also, if you have a few tens of billions IoT devices, if they all send the data to the cloud, just there is not enough bandwidth. So there is more localization of processing, which actually opens the way to have better privacy. Um, it's not clear we're gonna go there, but at least it's a possibility by having more local intelligence, we can also actually avoid having all our data being stored centrally and analyzed centrally. So I'll skip the details. Um, another trend is that we have, of course, big data, but we also have bigger breaches. And GDPR is now with us for a while. We've seen a few big finds, but I, keep, I see only the breaches getting bigger. And I recommend that you visit this website, uh, World's Biggest Data Breaches, um, and I think it starts at 10 million records. I mean, it goes back in history. I really recommend you, you watch, look there. There is, of course, many you have heard of in the press. There is also many you have not heard of. But the main message is, Every year, your data will be leaked at least once. This is the status today. And so, as an academic, I ask the question, we have a legal framework with fines, okay? But we still see that companies keep losing data at large scale. Why is it still allowed to collect data at large scale? Because it's obvious that even the large players can't protect our data, okay? So, I think it's also a security property. I don't have time to go into detail, but also for our security, we actually need to um, stop collecting this data in central databases. I, I just think it's too dangerous. Um, there is, of course, a policy debate here, and very often this debate is framed in the following way. We have collective security and individual privacy, and we have to balance these two things. And, of course, after all the threats, uh, the attacks we saw from 9-11 till the attacks in Brussels and more recent attacks, uh, what we have to do is we have to give up some individual privacy for more collective security. Now, this is a misframing of the debate because actually privacy is also a collective property. And I think we should think of big data in terms of pollution, right? By sharing your data, which in the one hand is good, you're encouraged to share your data. What you actually also do is create damages to other people, just like driving around in a polluting car. What's an example of these damages? Well, I think 10 years ago, there was an app on Facebook called Gaydar, and this app determined to which extent people are gay or homosexual, based on your language use, your friends, the books you read, the bars you visit, the music you like. So it's a clear example of straight and gay people leaking their data, and then in the end, some individuals who are homosexual and don't want to out this being outed by this tool. So privacy is a collective property, it should not be seen as an individual right only, it's a collective right of society. Who has an iPhone here? Okay, so the nice thing of the Snowden leaks of 2013 is I save time in making slides because I can use the slides of the NSA. These are internal slides of the NSA, and they say, who knew in 1984 that this would be Big Brother and the zombies would be paying customers? So, more or less, the NSA calls iPhone users public zombies who pay for their own surveillance. That's what's in the internal documents of the NSA, and by the way, it's the same for Android users. Okay? So, of course, it's not only about the data, it's also the metadata. This is the elephant in the room, um, and during the time of Snowden leaks, there was quite some blame from Europe to the US for collecting too much data. But don't remember, or do remember, we have data retention policies here, and we actually collect lots of metadata, which is almost as good as data. So where does it all bring us? I think in society you have users, you have industry and government, and unfortunately industry, at least the large players, are evolving towards surveillance capitalism. They actually make their money from doing mass surveillance and based on this offering useful services. So there is a different level of trust, this side of the Atlantic and the other side. In Europe, we tend to trust our governments more and we distrust industry. In the US, it seems to be the other way around. But in some sense, it doesn't matter because with big data, with the Internet of Things and with the advertising ecosystem, industry collects so much data and then government figured out with the PRISM program that actually they can get access to this data. 
So now the government has much more interest, at least part of the government, that the industry collects more data because the more data industry has, the more data government has. Of course, we can now argue that in the EU we don't have access to this data. Well, then look at what happened in the German parliament. There was clearly an investigation made where it was shown that the, in Germany some government agencies had access to some of the PRISM data. I think there is no doubt about this. So, trend six is again the iPhone users. We also have not only, I would say, the intelligence services, but also um, law enforcement. And there was a big case a couple of years ago of Apple versus the FBI. I guess for Apple users, it felt very good because Apple was defending you against the FBI, right? What happened was a terrorist killed 14 people. They found his iPhone and then uh, the, himself was dead. So it was not a big privacy case. And then the FBI wanted access to this one left iPhone of this guy. And they used a law from 1789 about iPhones called the All Ritz Order to actually uh, order Apple to decrypt the iPhone. And Apple's defense was, if we would do this, we'll actually undermine the overall ecosystem. Um, I guess you all know how the case ended, more or less. Um, the FBI dropped the case, paid close to a million dollars to an Israeli company to decrypt the iPhone. And then six months later, a researcher in Cambridge did the same trick for him at $50. So the FBI overpaid a bit, but they got access anyway. But of course, it's an old battle. When I was in the US in 93, 94, there was actually the Clipper chip where the US government tried to enforce a secure phone with the pack doors. As academics and industry, we thought we won this battle against pack doors in encryption. Um, but of course, in about 10 years ago, the FBI came back and said, we are going dark. And this is the previous FBI director, but all the current FBI directors have been repeating this. Um, in Europe, we have some signs of wisdom. So ANSIP, who says, I'm strongly against backdoor to encrypted systems. So I think this is a wise decision, and I hope that Europe stays with this decision. It's, of course, a very complex debate. I could spend the whole lecture on it. Um, it's a very big difference between having access to an iPhone of a deceased person to solve a crime versus hacking an iPhone in real time while the person is using the iPhone. And this is also happening, and we have everything in between. So in 2017, Europe published a communication in which they confirmed that they don't want to put backdoors in encryption. More collaboration between police forces is encouraged, some extra people for Europol, and then encouragement for collaboration, because it's clear that in some member states, there is advanced expertise in forensics and in hacking devices and in online policing. In other member states, there is not so much expertise. I guess the question is, what is Europe going to do? And I will come back to this uh, in terms of how intrusive do we allow um, these police forces to go? Which kind of technologies can they use? Which can they not use? So to kind of give you an idea of encryption, because that's part of the topic of my talk, um, when I started in, in cryptography, it was 1987. I think a crypto box cost 10,000 euro. There were some crypto boxes in the banks, and there were some in governments and military, but crypto box was just too expensive to own. I, I was very proud to have seen a few in a company, but you could not own a crypto box was unthinkable as an academic or looking at one in your office was kind of unthinkable in 1987. Today, my estimate is we have about 35 billion crypto devices, hardware or software. Um, so in your pockets, you have a phone which has encryption for the Wi-Fi, for TLS, for the hard disk and so on. Um, you have your bank cards, your access card, um, secure updates. About half of that crypto is actually used to protect organizations and governments against you. So most people think that their bank card is there to protect their money, but that's a misunderstanding. The bank card is there to protect the bank against you. So you will not spend more money than you have. Right? So also an access card is not there to protect you, it's to protect the organization from you or somebody else who is not entitled to enter a room to enter that room. Also, the same thing with content encryption or secure updates. Secure updates are very nice because you don't get malicious updates, but you don't get to choose. If there is an update, you, get it, you take it or you leave it. You cannot say, I like part one, two, and three, but the fourth thing I don't want. So it's, you're not in control as a user with the crypto. The good news is there is about 14 to 15 billion devices where crypto is used to protect the user. The biggest system is our mobile phone system, which is not end-to-end -end encrypted. 
So the phone calls, encryption stops at the base station or the base station controller. The second biggest system is the web ecosystem. Um, the web ecosystem has been improved recently a lot with TLS 1.3. But what has Etsy done? Within three months, they made a backdoor version of TLS 1.3 called Enterprise TLS, which actually is, takes away a lot of security benefits from TLS 1.3 and makes it in such that you can actually intercept encrypted communications. That's a European contribution. Um, luckily, the academics also contributed to TLS 1.3, um, but that's what happened. There is also problems with the, the CA ecosystem. So this is why I color all these bars red. Um, Things are a bit better in encryption on devices. So phone encryption is getting better, um, and this is helping us. Um, in, in terms of the apps, there is also some improvement there. So after Snowden, we got more and more end-to-end -end encryption. And the question is now, um, how much of those still make backups in the clear in the cloud for benefit of intelligence or law enforcement? And of course, how easy is it to remotely hack the devices? So we no longer go after the crypto, we go after the device, which is an improvement. But I think the general message is, at least if we speak as an academic to an end user, we put 35 billion crypto devices in the field, and very few protect your data effectively. We protect organizations very effectively, we protect business interests very effectively, but personal data of citizens we actually don't protect very well. So if you use this thing here to make a call today, and you don't use single, you just use a normal call, you should be aware that the call will be encrypted until the base station or base station controller, and then it goes in the clear. So we still don't have secure phone calls today. This holds for European politicians, European industry. They have sensitive information, they make calls, it can be intercepted. It goes over the SS7 network, and there have been demonstrations at the Chaos Computer Club conference. You somehow bribe an operator in Africa, you get into the SS7, you can listen to any phone. So, of course, I do understand why there is no end-to-end -end encryption, because law enforcement was against this. On the other hand, we have to make a choice in society. Do we want secure communication for people for our, to protect our economy, or do we want um, to actually open up our systems and be vulnerable to other nations, but also to organized crime? As a cryptographer, I have to say a few things about quantum computers, um, and I'm very glad as an academic that Europe is investing a lot in this now. So this is a fantastic idea, but actually um, was conceived in the 80s. The first trials were done in the 90s. The first factorization onto the computer was done in 2001. Um, but the problem of quantum computers is that it undermines modern cryptography. Not everything, but about half of it um, is in trouble. And so on the one hand, the EU is spending a lot of money on building quantum computers. On the other hand, it's actually undermining the security of our ecosystem. Um, and there is real progress here. Um, I'll skip over the numbers, but... So the idea is that to factor RSA 1024, you need about 2,000 qubits, and we're arriving at 128 qubits, but we're not that close because you would really need one and a half million qubits. These are just rough estimates. Um, there is a difference between logic and physical qubits, but that would bring me too far. So I'll skip this slide, but you can look at it later. It's a very simple math thing. So, what I wanted to show is here crypto competitions. So progress in cryptography is actually very nice. It, and it goes to open competitions. And you see on top um, the desk competition in the 70s, the AES competition. You had Vincent Ryman here who won the competition in the 90s. And another Belgian won the Chartres competition, the Belgian team. In the middle, you see the European competitions, the right project I mentioned at the beginning. Then I had the Nessie project and the eStream project. And then Japan also has a series of things. But as you see, there is no more European competitions. Um, in, in modern times, competitions are the US. There is authenticated encryption. There is a post-quantum and the lightweight encryption. So apparently, Europe no longer funds cryptographic competitions. Um, so I think it's very interesting that the EU does not have a crypto policy. And this is, I think, the consequence of decisions by the member states. The member states see crypto as part of national security. I've been saying this here in Brussels for about 25 years, that this is a problem. Um, for example, in those crypto competitions organized by NIST, the research is being done mostly by the Europeans, but the decisions are taken by NIST because Europe rather, rather agree among themselves, they rather have the Americans make decisions, our American friends. They make good decisions. As a Belgian, I can't complain because they keep choosing Belgian algorithms. But still, as a European, I'm not so happy about this. Okay. 
It's even worse. Um, with the Network of Excellence, um, in 2004, we created a document, an extensive document, that actually says which is good crypto and which is bad crypto, which should be retired. Just recommendations for industry. This recommendation is widely used by the banks and by industry in general. When my Network of Excellence ended, it was taken over by ENISA. Um, but then actually in 2014, ENISA ran into trouble. Some member states wanted the document to be unpublished. And so now I had a project which ended a year ago where we made a new version or two new versions, but I have no more funding and I don't know what ENISA will do, but it just shows you uh, the challenges for Europe. So then the final point I wanted to make is that this is getting serious. When I was working in cryptography in the beginning, it was just the banks, a few users. But now, of course, cybersecurity is part of national security, and all the armies are switching to cyber war. You may have read last week that Iran and the US are now continuing their war not by retaliation with bombings, but actually by having cyber war. OK, I think this is interesting. This is also already this warning was in Snowden's document that the NSA does not only collect data, analyze data, but also hacks everything. Okay. If you're a smaller nation, you don't have the budget for the NSA, there is companies you can hire, like Hacking Team. Um, and Hacking Team rents its services to police forces, um, and they believe that fighting crime should be easy. We know a lot about Hacking Team because Hacking Team got hacked. And all their tools and all their customers uh, were open on the internet. Um, and I would say, look at the list of countries. Not everybody on the list respect, respects the human rights. And still, we sell them hacking tools from the EU. So the side effect of the government hoarding these hacking tools is they don't help companies. They have a conflict of interest. Governments find flaws in products. They don't tell the industry about the flaw, but they rather write exploits. Then the governments get hacked themselves. These exploits then end up in the wild. And then, of course, they're used. Examples are WannaCry, Petya, not Petya, against our economy. So there is, I think, a very interesting conversation that has to happen inside governments between those who collect zero days and write hacks and those that actually are responsible for national security or security of the industry. So I have only one question about this. I don't think we can stop this. I think it would be naive to think that you can stop large-scale hacking by nation states. The same thing is happening by police forces. Police forces are today hacking. I don't think large scale, but they are hacking into systems. And my only question I ask to policymakers is, who shall watch over the guards? This is so powerful tools that we also need a very powerful supervision to avoid abuses. To wrap up, um, I think it all comes down to architecture. Um, and it goes a bit back to my analogy with the cloud. That actually, if you centralize everything, you centralize control, and you give up a lot of your power. Um, so the internet could be architected in a much more distributed way than it is today. And it's not about fixing a link here or adding some quantum key distribution there. You really have to think of the architecture in terms of resilience um, and privacy. Cryptography is being used more and more, not only for communications and storage, but for protecting data during computation. And I would not say much more about this, but this is where, of course, the big challenges are. And this is something which, of course, quantum key distribution cannot solve. So this is very different. This is now being used by large players. So you keep your data in your own protected storage, but you still do valuable computation on the data between multiple parties. And this is no longer science fiction. There is startups on this, and there is lots of research. I'll skip the details. And to wrap up, I want to say something. Um, if you think about all this hacking, the backdoor debates, nation states undermining, and so on, Honestly, if I look, um, people ask me, what is the solution? I think the long-term solution is to have an open infrastructure, have open hardware and open software so that everybody is on level terms. And then we have to investigate what kind of business models we can have for this. But as long as we have closed systems, there will always be those who know what's happening and those who don't know what's happening. So I mentioned this in the European Parliament 2014, but I was very naive. Um, so I told them they should invest in open systems, but I didn't tell them how much. So they spent about one or two million euro to evaluate the security of open source security systems. I think Europe should spend several billion euros in building a secure open infrastructure. I think that's the only long-term solution for the next 10 years. So I will stop here. I think I, you can get my conclusion slides later. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Professor. You're also challenging EU policymakers in your presentations, and uh, so we're learning even more than uh, we expected. I'd like to open the floor for questions because I am absolutely uh, sure that uh, uh, you have comments or questions for the professor after this uh, fascinating presentation. Um, since you're asking for the floor, I'd like to make a particular mention to the fact that we have a special company with us attending the session of Connect University. I'd like to welcome a group of colleagues from the Aegis Cybersecurity Project who are with us today. Uh, this is the international session of the university, and uh, this is a project that contributes to the collaboration between the European Union and the United States, especially in the area of research, but priority setting as well for policy making. You have given us a lot of interesting food for thought for a recent uh, dialogue in the area of ICT with the United States, and we are particularly thankful that you're with us today. And I think there is a question also from the group. If you can also. Well, uh, thank you very much for your comments. Um, as you said, uh, we have our Aegis delegation here. All the partners are represented. I also want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Polemi, who was our project officer, for all her advice and counsel. Uh, my question really goes to the intersection of innovation and policy and how we can catalyze that on both sides of the Atlantic. So in listening to some of your comments, uh, and I think the argument can be made that particularly for the cyber uh, sector, it's, we, we have to acknowledge that uh, it's a very dynamic space that is being led by industry. And uh, by nature, government policy frequently is reactive uh, rather than proactive. And I think that is ever so much more true for cyber. When you look at uh, whether it's Bitcoin leading to blockchain technology, which has repercussions throughout many industries, AI, machine learning, whatever it might be, um, and being president of the European American Chamber of Commerce in Princeton, I think I have a little bit of a biased perspective that industry can help here. I'm wondering how we can uh, catalyze a better uh, partnering in terms of collaboration on an international scale between like-minded blocks of countries. Uh, so the US, of course, uh, has produced a number of unicorns that are leading the way in innovation. Uh, we have the Huawei case in China that is problematic, I think, for our like-minded uh, entities. And uh, we have GDPR, which uh, I think many in the US, if not in the U EU, are viewing as a chilling factor to innovation. So uh, my main question then goes back to how to stimulate from a policy standpoint uh, from uh, the government side a better partnering uh, to really ratchet up innovation rather than you know, coming at it from a number of uh, programs or other, perhaps we could call it non-practical methods of uh, really ratcheting up uh, where we want to go uh, within even two, three years rather than a 10-year uh, time frame because if you look 10 years uh, prior, Facebook wasn't even uh, a force. And now they're leading not only in social media, but also privacy versus security, as well as introducing its uh, own cryptocurrency. Thank you. Are there? I collect the. Yes, one more. I just wanted to ask you are you optimistic or pessimistic as regards the future? Ah, sorry, I am uh, from DigiTaxu, so um, I'm not from DigiConnect. <laughs> so I will say optimism is a moral duty. <laughs> we have to be optimistic. Um, but I do think a lot of things have to change in, in the right direction. And I think at EU level, we should have more collaboration between member states. And I think this is what is blocking the EU there. I think some things we can do together very well, but other things are reserved. And I don't think you can, in this technology, draw a line and say, I'll do A and B, and you do C, and it's all going to work. I think that's a very big challenge we are facing. Um, 
Thank you for, for your comments. Um, let me first um, say I agree we should try to increase innovation and maybe I'm not the expert on this, although I have quite some experience and I also did work in the US and I work with US companies and also companies all through the world. Let me just first challenge one point. I don't think GDPR uh, chills innovation. If, for example, you have multi-party computation where everybody keeps their data and creates value without sharing the data, this is innovation stimulated to GDPR where you get similar services, maybe slightly less efficient, maybe but much less intrusive. And so actually there is GDPR can also be a catalyst for innovation where we stop collecting large quantities of data. If you don't believe after my talk that we should stop doing this, everybody should make their own conclusions. I do believe we'll keep losing large quantities of data and in the end this will harm society. I think we're now more like in the 50s where the industry is exploding and we put all our trash in the rivers and then after 30 years we wake up and say, look, uh, we have too high CO2, too many small particles. And so I think the awareness will come. So I'm, I'm not so sure that GDPR is actually stifling innovation. It of course stops certain business models or makes certain business models more difficult but maybe we should be innovative and try to offer similar services with different technical approaches. So I agree it stops certain business models or it makes it more, more difficult, but it doesn't mean it stops innovation. Um, I think how we can collaborate better, this is very difficult um, because you first need to have trust. And I think that's, this is where the, the big challenge is in the future is what can you share, what can you not share? I think in cryptography there has been a very good collaboration though, because it seems to be like a very isolated area where you can collaborate very well between parties. But of course, as it gets more sensitive in certain areas, it becomes difficult to collaborate if you actually don't want to trust each other. And I think to be very honest, um, the member states have the same problem inside the EU. They do trust each other, but I can tell you that police force in country or member state X will not share all their latest tools with police force in member state Y. Why? Well, they may be actually investigating each other. So that's, that, that's kind of the, the problem we have to, to look at. And um, what I do believe is that we can make progress by focusing on excellence. And I think having a market-oriented approach, but, and I'm more a believer in the DARPA model than the EU model. I mean, some of my colleagues have DARPA funding. It's a very tough model for the researcher because there is a very high pressure being put. The, pro the project owner is in the project and watches and also the project officer watches every quarter what you do. So the pressure is enormous. Um, but on the other hand, um, I think it's much more effective um, than I would say the EU approach, which I think has big benefits in creating collaboration and creating networks. But in terms of the problem of the EU projects is that after a couple of years, there is result, the project ends, and then everybody goes their own way. Because using the results is very often um, too difficult. And I have now one exception. I think after 50 projects, we now have a project in our group where a startup came out, which actually we based in Switzerland uh, in the crypto curve. But this is an exception. That actually that's something in a project. I think it benefits what we develop, but it doesn't go quickly in the market. And very often I see people just re-implement everything because of the IPR constraints and all the other things. But I do believe in, in, in collaboration if we have the, the necessary trust basis. And I do believe in more dynamic models. Indeed, I don't think this idea of writing work plans for, for three or four years and having the time from conceiving a project to the completion of four or five years, um, that works if you do fundamental research or, or strategic research. But if you want to solve a concrete problem, um, it has to be more dynamic. policy standpoint, uh, would you have any comments? Or no? Yeah, I think. Keep it short. Then. Yeah, I think what Bart is saying, yeah, what Bart is saying is the, uh, I mean, uh, well, when it comes to policy coordination, I don't know, between uh, Europe and the US, uh, they, uh, I think we're progressing. My, uh, although we, we have, as I said before, a different approach to legal framework in general. I mean, GDPR is a good example. GDPR, we decided by law that personal data need to be protected. The US would wait for the first case where you have a problem and they will react. 
This is the way it works. I mean, I'm simplifying. I'm simplifying. This is the difference between ex ante and ex post. Now, uh, the, I think the two systems have advantages and inconveniences. What we have decided that, for, that uh, trust is an essential element for the development of uh, 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 the digital economy and society. It is uh, essential. This is what our citizen like. Uh, this is what our businesses, uh, what our citizens aspire to. You need to create the trust in the development of uh, the digital economy society, and that's what guided us since the beginning. Now, I think the uh, uh, and I understand that some of the reactions, uh, uh, initial reactions, transatlantic were. Uh, you know, this is the EU again, it over-regulates, etc. But I think that the experience has shown that we were on the right track. We were on the right track. I mean, how many leaks do we need to have? How many excessive use of our personal data do we need to have to understand this? It is there. So I think that's... Uh, now, we are progressing. We have different approaches to, you know, the, the way we develop uh, legal frameworks. But ultimately, uh, the, our goal is the same. We need to create that trust uh, in the digital transformation of our economy and society. But that's on the general framework that I wanted to mention. We will maintain the dialogue with our colleagues, of course, with the US, and this is you know, our biggest trading partner. And we have like-minded citizens, like-minded uh, way of looking at cultures. So I think it's, uh, it's imperative that we work together. It is imperative. Thank you, Khalil. And I'd like to thank the professor for uh, this very informative session that you offered us. The message of uh, optimism that uh, we have to keep uh, being optimistic uh, as our moral. Remember to include the for the GDPR. I'm sorry, I did not give the floor to other colleagues. We will come back in the end if we have time, out of respect for our next speaker. So uh, I will be uh, giving the floor again for questions when we finish with the next presentation. Sincere, thank you again. Thank you. you. You have given us so much food for thought also at a time when European policy making on artificial intelligence is at its height. So it's very important to have the perspective from the real world, from the researchers and from people like yourselves who have the expertise that we need to address these questions. I would like to thank Professor Brunel, to thank Oleg. I, I would like to thank all of you for being here today. We had hundreds of people on the live stream. I'd like to thank them for staying with us until now. I understand everybody is live. Uh, I would like to thank Andrea from the Connect University, Professor Polemi, who uh, uh, actually organized this session, and Konstantinos from my team. Thanks to all of you, and we're back uh, here tomorrow. And for the participants, we have this special uh, demonstration right outside the room. Thank you. <laughs>